Please welcome Mitchell Strauss, John Hurley, Matt Homer, and Ida Rademacher to the stage. We have a short panel to end uh, the, some of the content part today, and I feel like we've done an entire dress rehearsal twice sitting in the green room. Uh, so we're going to try to recreate the incredible conversation we've been having here with all of you again, again today. Uh, so I'm Ida Rademacher, as we, as we just mentioned, and I'm actually uh, more domestically focused with my work on financial inclusion. Uh, and I think the way that it connects and the way that we're going to talk about it some today uh, with this amazing panel is that uh, financial inclusion is a means to an end, and the fill in the, fill in the blank end can be a lot of different things uh, for different countries. Financial inclusion can lead to greater economic growth, it can lead to greater security, it can be a strategy within a strategy in many ways. In the US, uh, domestically, it's not very high up on the agenda yet in terms of a coordinated strategy. In other parts of the world, it's, it is a more coordinated strategy and a bigger tool in the toolbox for economic development and inclusive growth. Uh, and then I just say, get, getting into the conversation, that part of what we'd like to do today is wrap this up with a little bit of a deeper dive look at some of the ways that US government agencies uh, have looked at the different mandates and roles that they have to play and the way that uh, financial inclusion strategies and tools are helping to contribute to those types of goals. So I think people have mentioned who this panel is, but we're gonna, we're gonna try to have more of a dialogue than a, than a hub and spoke kind of conversation. Uh, but again, we've got, we've got uh, just to my left, uh, uh, John Hurley, who's a visiting policy fellow at the Center for Global Development, Mitchell Strauss, special advisor at Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, and Matt Homer, who's a sen senior digital finance advisor at USAID. So welcome, all of you. Uh, so I said, said a little bit about the why for me, about why financial inclusion in a domestic sense. I think that we've seen in this country, and I think in many of the people in the room in other countries, that when households don't have economic stability and economic opportunity, it can, it can do more than destabilize the household. It can have ripple effects into the macroeconomic outcome. But what are the whys of financial inclusion for your individual agencies? Why do you do this work? And, and for you, I'd say that there's a proxy <laughs> role that you're playing in some ways and speaking right. from your own perspective now at uh, Center for Global Development as well, John. Right, so uh, as, as uh, Ida said, I'm at the Center for Global Development um, for one year on sabbatical from Treasury. And so I'll just speak from uh, my experience at Treasury um, in dealing with the financial inclusion matters. And under the previous administration, it was a very high priority. There were two financial inclusion forums that we co-hosted with USAID uh, in which we tried to promote uh, the importance of financial inclusion both domestically and abroad. And from Treasury's perspective, um, I mean, you've already commented uh, the, really the two primary reasons why this is has been really important for Treasury is the macroeconomic growth perspective, both domestically and abroad. Uh, and I know that uh, McKinsey has done some a lot of good work on this, which brings out the facts on how this can contribute to economic growth and job growth throughout the world. And then the stability aspect of it, and uh, that's uh, so it's from our sort of enforcement side of things, um, for us, for Treasury, it has been financial exclusion being a major risk to f the financial mm -hmm. system and the integrity of the financial system. So we want to promote financial inclusion to address the risk of financial exclusion. We want uh, the Treasury is very focused on uh, promoting a risk-based approach to uh, financial inclusion so that uh, banking services for individuals are pr provided uh, and that institutions who provide those services are not de-risking in a way that uh, is not what we deem as what they deem as appropriate for the system. So those are the two primary reasons uh, are the, st the stability and security and the macroeconomic growth. And is there, um, when you say stability and security, is there a, a national security component to that that you're also thinking of when you think of cybersecurity? Is that part sure, of Sure, I mean, it's part of, part of the integrity of the financial system. You know, you want a financial system which has credibility and trust from individuals. 
And so that is extremely important for the preservation of our own financial system. And given that the United States, and particularly New York City, is a money center, you know, the United States is one of the few money center places in the world, London and uh, Singapore, New York. It's really, really important that we maintain the credibility and integrity of that system here in the United States. Great. Mitchell, let me ask you the same question. Why financial inclusion in, in, at OPIC? And, and, and how long has that work been evolving? Well, I don't know how many of you know what OPIC stands for. So it's the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is a US government agency that was initially funded by the taxpayer. And we paid the money back. And each year, we've been giving more than $100 million to the Treasury. As a development finance institution, our work has always been to promote development, assisting US businesses who are doing work in emerging market countries. We identified uh, the importance of reaching out to individuals through microfinance institutions probably 13 years ago uh, with a really sophisticated way of going about it, which involved reading an article and somebody saying, gosh, this looks great. It's highly developmental. We ought to do this. <laughs> And we started with uh, the best of the US networks, and we began doing transactions. And uh, we were very pleased to have announced more than a, a billion dollars of support through microfinance institutions. And I've been somewhat humbled while we've been speaking here because of the focus on the financial inclusion aspect, whereas we've seen the delivery system of microfinance institutions, coupled with innovation in terms of software, uh, computer applications, or programming, reach out so that the same mechanism that's bringing us financial inclusion is also available to, say, a smallholder farmer to access other information. So uh, in terms of engaging people in rural parts of the world in, in sort of a better system that promotes a whole host of livelihood activities. It's sort of being led through financial inclusion. And that's why we're so keenly interested in it. Great. And, and Matt, I think yours also, there's a lot of different contexts for financial inclusion within USAID. But when did it become um, a, a really focused and targeted strategy? And kind of what's the why that perpetuates at USAID? Sure, yeah, I think similar to OPIC, I mean, USAID has been involved in financial inclusion for a long time, I mean, particularly during the formative period of the microfinance industry. More recently, I think over the last few years, we've really focused on digital approaches to financial inclusion and digital payments and digital finance in particular. And I think you know, our interest really, I would say, is, is sort of for two reasons. I mean, one is for the sake of financial inclusion itself. I think we, we heard Gloria speak about the recent evidence that's come out from Kenya and, and has been published in Science Magazine, which really demonstrates the huge impact um, that mobile money can have in lifting households out of poverty and helping improve their resilience against shocks. So that's very important to us. And, and a digital approach is a way to lower the cost of reaching these populations, but also reach many more, many more people than you would through a, you know, a brick and mortar approach. So, you know, I think that's one reason. The second reason is, and I think it's something you were talking about earlier, Ida, is uh, financial inclusion as a means to an end. Um, so we also view digital finance as a way to help us achieve our other development objectives. So it, in, ag in agriculture space, for example, is a way to help improve access to credit for small smallholder farmers. And in the energy space, it's a way to um, increase the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the use of off-grid solar technology, which relies on mobile money SIM cards. Um, so I think we're very interested in how it can be used to help us achieve those sector impacts in different areas. Um, I mean, I, we were also listening to Ruth speak from the Better Than Cash Lines today, and of course she was talking about the, you know, the anti-corruption benefits of digital payments, which are also yeah. something very important to us. And then programmatically, I mean, regardless of the topic, there are huge benefits um, in how, you know, in, in transitioning from cash handling to, to sort of to digital disbursements. I mean, in some of the, uh, the regions and places where we operate, um, transporting cash can be very expensive and very dangerous. So I think there are a lot of um, benefits at the program level. 
Um, and then I think at a, at a more macro level too, I mean, we're focused on you know, digital payments as a way to build inclusive digital economies that are good for consumers, create new opportunities for consumers, but also are, are good for, for business in those countries as well. Yeah, no, I think it's, maybe there's just more use cases in USA than almost anywhere in terms of the level of mm -hmm. development goals that you're integrating uh, digital finance strategies into. Um, but that does get us in some ways into this second piece of a just a real basic, we decided to do a real basic C spot run version of financial inclusion to just keep this at a pretty high level of potential for the role of government in this space. But, and so the why feels pretty consistent across agencies. And I would say that um, it has grow, the interest has grown you know, across agencies over time, uh, looking at how this tool can be effective. But the what is, the application is different. So you said a little bit, Mitchell, about uh, micro enterprise. Is, are there other ways in terms of the what and the how of financial inclusion for, uh, for OPIC that you are excited about or that you've been, you think that you've left some really good examples that other countries can look at about the way the government can facilitate things through financial inclusion? Well, from a product standpoint, OPIC has a toolkit that involves financing and political risk insurance. And the political risk insurance piece of it, you pay premiums and will mitigate things like inconvertibility of a currency or make a payment if there's an event where there's expropriation or the taking over of, of your activities in a given country. We primarily focus on the provision of financing and we do it from very small to quite large. And what we're doing there is either lending directly to early stage innovative transactions that are presented to us under our portfolio for impact, many of which involve the linkage between microfinance institutions, mm -hmm. software pro programs, and say healthcare as an example. So we do that in one small program then we do expansion financing. So you're starting to see as a company grows, we have a different window to access financing because so many times we see, particularly in the field of innovation, uh, great contests and great innovation. And then there's a what happens next issue. So after we support them through one program, we graduate them to another program. And then lastly, our larger programs involve supporting equity funds where large investors invest equity. We top it up with debt because we don't have an equity product. And then they go and concentrate. And FinTech is one of the hottest areas for that type of endeavor. So that window is now open. We call it global engagement. So we're supporting companies that are small, large uh, in their de endeavors and particularly in places like India where the where there are huge take up of both the small interventions and and larger scale were very active and so kind of to draw the through line uh, you're working in almost a b2b way you're working business to business your the financing is for it's either a business or it may be an intermediary mm -hmm who reaches yeah. other businesses, but that it can be partner, a fund. But that can, I'm just wondering if, if, if India itself has a financial inclusion strategy and it is working on how do individuals and communities get certain kinds of tools in their own hands, these things become a pretty good marriage in some ways, right? Oh, you're absolutely. You're facilitating the consumer base with digital financial tools. You're creating a financial larger ecosystem environment where economic growth potential somehow magnifies between these things. Is that what you're Absolutely. seeing? Is that intentional? But well, we're always working in some way, shape, or form with a US entity. We're not working primarily government to government. We're a private sector focused yep. uh, agency. We actually grew out of USAID. Yep. So when a government announces a strategy, when a government creates a safe and excellent working environment through its regulations, it makes it easy for entities such as OPIC to support investment, that's where we can bring our money to bear on the ground, building products and services. And I think, you know, it's not often said, but to be able to, you know, we use the word scale, which is to have a great intervention and then to roll it out, 
not necessarily across Africa, but just across a country so that we get that kind of, you know, everyone should be able to have access to safe money and these other products. Mm -hmm. Great, and let's bring it back to Treasury as well in terms of the, the different how and what of Treasury's work here. So I would uh, say there's basically three primary streams of, of the how for Treasury. One is uh, in terms of regulatory frameworks and, and working with countries, and we have a, this gets a little bit into the, the what, but we have, um, we have an Office of Technical Assistance um, and one of their programs is on financial inclusion. They're currently working in eight countries to help them in terms of financial inclusion strategies, but also the regulatory framework. So you want to establish a proper regulatory framework which balances um, the need to eliminate barriers to entry with proper consumer protections mm -hmm. and whatnot. So, so that's one of the focuses of their work. Um, also, the um, uh, financial capability is, is a big issue for, for Treasury, particularly domestically. And uh, the Treasury chairs something called the Financial Literacy and Economic uh, Commission. It's uh, composed of a number of different U.S. government agencies involved in this area. And they are promoting programs which, um, which uh, advance financial literacy in the United States. I'm not sure who in the U.S. Uh, or who, who in the audience uh, comes from the U.S., but I remember when I was in high school, one of the uh, best courses I had had to do with this topic. I mean, we learned a lot about, about basic financial literacy. It was a, an elective, um, and I think in many, many states in the United States, it's still an elective type of thing, but I think there's, trying to, there's a need to promote it and to make it more than just an elective. So financial literacy is a big component. And then just messaging and using the power of the voice and Treasury's leadership and financial issues and trying to you know, raise the profile of this issue. And, we did, and Treasury did that under the previous administration with USAID when they had these financial inclusion forms. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important component as well. I, I, um, I think that the capability piece, it is big in the US. It feels like a lot of the international has been more supply side focused. Uh, and I think one of, the, one of the places where I certainly saw those financial inclusion forums start to talk about the role of government and making sure that supply and demand meet someplace constructive for both ends, right? For, for the growth uh, pieces, but also for the livelihood aspects. And so what level of uh, equipping of individuals do you need to have with certain kinds of information to make better choices, mm -hmm. but then you can't leave it all there. What's the, what, how does technology, and I think that's really the next question here, that the really rapid acceleration of uh, digital and technology as the currency of financial inclusion, has it changed the way that your agencies work in this space? And I don't wanna project into the future, but even just looking at the last five years, has there been significant changes in the priorities or the kind of activities. I mean, the R2A we just heard about is one example of that. But uh, when you think about the US government's role in equipping leaders or businesses or creating the conditions for exchange to happen, are there big changes that have happened because of the technological, the rapid technological change and opportunities? Well, I can speak for Treasury in that in terms of the whole risk environment and uh, Treasury's involvement in the Financial Action Task Force, I think that this is an issue, financial inclusion, that's being taken up much more seriously in that mm. uh, context because of these evolving technologies, because there's an, 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 a perception that there is this increased risk given the digitalization. So it needs to be addressed so in a way to mitigate those risks and to address them in an appropriate manner so that um, financial service providers in this regulatory environment are not uh, uh, unintentionally impairing our efforts to expand financial inclusion. And then, um, I, and that's one area. And then the, just the whole digitalization, uh, we work closely with USAID and a number of people around the world last year and with China on developing some principles for digital financial inclusion, which uh, we're carrying, the G20, is carrying forward in terms of trying to implement those principles in a, in a country by country basis. 
do more to add to that, Matt? No, yeah, I would just, I mean, I think that what digital has done is it's just made financial inclusion within reach much more within reach, right? Within a very, I mean, potentially a, a very quick period of, of, of yeah. time. Um, one thing that we've done at USAID and continues to be a work in progress that wouldn't have been possible without digital payments is that, you know, we've now made it an expectation that in any USAID programming that, that involve payments, payments to vendors, payments to beneficiaries, any types of payments, that those payments be done digitally, um, you know, where possible. Um, and that wouldn't have been possible I mean, before, you know, digitally. So another program, way that you're using yeah. the power of US government to drive right. toward an objective there. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna ask one more question and then ask people here to, to jump in with conversation because yeah. I think that we, we are standing between um, the ambassador's <laughs> remarks and a drink. So, you know, there's some important yeah. pieces yeah. there. But it strikes me that we are actually at a frontier space of the US yeah. defining the kinds of things it can do if it prioritizes financial inclusion as one of the things. So I'm just wondering, are there unique roles that your agencies have played uh, that but for playing them, certain changes wouldn't have happened, certain conditions wouldn't be the same? Do you, can you think of anything that, uh, you know, that's uniquely important about the roles that your agencies have played in advancing these goals of financial inclusion globally? I mean, John has sort of talked about one already, which is I think the convening power of government and the ability for government to be sort of a neutral facilitator. Yeah. I mean, we did this through the Financial Inclusion Forum, I mean, really, which brought together, you know, the whole of government to, to talk about how we approach this issue in an interagency way. And then, in, in, you know, USAID is in approximately 80 markets, and in those markets where we are, wow. it's, it's, a, it's a pretty important, I think, comparative advantage for the agency being able to convene stakeholders. So in India, for example, we brought together over 100 companies um, to focus on the issue of last mile payments between consumers and merchants. And it was something that wasn't happening before, but we were able to create a neutral platform for that conversation to happen among the private sector. Because we work internationally, it's hard to speak for the domestic scene. Well, I would say even internationally, is there a specific role you think that... I think one of the greatest things that we've been able to accomplish in the last few years, and although it's been going on, I think it's going on more, and that is to work hand in hand with some of these innovative foundations like Amidia and Gates that you've heard from today, where, where together we're sort of filling the gaps of a problem. In a, in a coordinated fashion. Now we can of course do more, but to the extent we work together on behalf of the end users, I think we get efficiencies. And we have a long way to go and there's lots of need out there, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I thank Rosita and the Pro Inspire team, the Franklin Fellow people. With one uh, paid fellow, we'll take a, a step forward and I'm particularly interested in that person's ability to coordinate with other agencies because sometimes uh, after many years in the government you realize some people are here for a few years, some people are here for a long time and in order to make progress we have to work in a consistent way toward an end goal and for us it's always the uh, underserved people of the world. That's great. And I'll let me hear that and I'll say a little bit more about that fellowship. I'm excited about it. Um, I would just say, um, my experience at Treasury, I would, I would point to the G20 Global Partnership on Financial Inclusion. Um, the United States is a primary voice in that body for um, pushing this agenda. And uh, I think we, as evidenced by our work last year with the Chinese, we were able to bring together a number of people to, to promote these G20 principles for digital financial inclusion. I, uh, you know, it's always hard to prove the counterfactual, but it, without the U.S. there, I'm not sure that that would have happened. Um, also, uh, using our 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 um, position within the multilateral development institutions and to be able to impress upon them the importance of this and their leadership, and and I think that that's been quite successful as well. Um, and I would also say, in the uh, sort of on the enforcement side. Uh, our role in, within the Financial Action Task Force to promoting this risk-based approach and recognizing that, you know, while there are security concerns, there are also financial inclusion concerns and that we have to balance the two in an appropriate way. I think those are three things that uh, 
from Treasury's perspective, if we weren't there, I'm not sure you would uh, come to yeah. the same. I mean, it feels important to stop and reflect on those at times and think about it. And uh, I would say that all three of your agencies are going to be one of the new homes for the Pro Inspire Fellowship in Digital Finance. So these ideas of, I think Kabir said it earlier from our, our Midiar network, a little bit of policy entrepreneurs. So looking, you know, that, that fellowship, uh, that Gates is, is working with Pro Inspire. It's very exciting. It's a, a real unique opportunity, I think, for individuals with experience in digital finance to work inside of government context over the next several years to really push on some of these things that you've talked about that the, these agencies have made a big difference in. So our time is up. I don't, do we have time for questions or no time for questions? I think we're wrapped up, then I am sorry I took over, but drinks and questions will be great. Thank you. I think people will be able to converse uh, in uh, more relaxed circumstances. So um, first of all, thank you all for, for being here. I wanted to make, make a few remarks, thank all of our, our panelists and participants. Um, we're going to have a working group come together in next month to sort of think about um, how we take some of these uh, these great collaborations forward. Um, we're also going to be extending a scholarship to uh, several of the participants to kind of continue their study and capacity uh, enhancement on the on the financial uh, uh, digital financial services issue. Um, and if you're interested in either the working group or the scholarship, I say scholarship. It's a uh, a smallish scholarship, but it, it it's still a scholarship. Um, please see Frank Justice or Megan Devlin. I'd like to thank the Gates Foundation in particular for uh, their support and for gathering us today. And if I could ask you, we're going to open these doors here, um, and you'll just walk out onto the terrace and make a right into the Linden Grove, and we invite you all to uh, share uh, uh, some fellowship and some food and drink with us. And thank you again for being here. <laughs>